I have a Degenerate Friday edition of Defoe on 5, Jeff DeForest, and uh, my partner here is one Mr. Mike Luby Lubitz. And it's getting to the point where you're wondering if uh, maybe you're dreaming. Uh, it's possible that this isn't real. Maybe I'm imagining the whole thing. But uh, we did it again last night. Luby and I say we because uh, we're talking about our newly adapted Miami Marlins. We <laughs> love them. We thought they were going to be just an absolute crack of shit going into the season. Had no idea what was going to happen. We're wondering what on earth became of Sixto Sanchez. How are we going to deal with uh, the fact that uh, we're in the National League East, which was a division that was absolutely loaded with the defending National League champion Philadelphia Phillies involved. Uh, they get a couple of injuries. Had Bryce Harper out to begin the season. He came back pretty quickly. Reese Hopkins. But was another Hoskins was another guy that uh, Philadelphia was counting on heavily. He was out for the year. All right, so maybe some damaging blows there. The New York Mets had a three hundred and sixty-five million dollar payroll. Had just picked up uh, Justin Verlander. Had made other additions to the club uh, that was supposed to be pretty good to begin with. Uh, they had invested all this money in Francisco Lindor. They were going to be impossible to beat. We know the Braves that uh, were going to be good, and the only team that we we're going to be able to pick on in the division was the Washington Nationals, and even that was suspect, Luby. That was suspect going into the season. We talked to various people about it. We asked about Kim Ng. People are thinking, eh, the woman's crazy, but what does she have to work with? It's not like she's sitting there with the bankroll that Brian Cashman has to use with the New York Yankees, or uh, for that matter, uh, Epler with the Mets. Spending all kinds of dough, it doesn't matter. When it's unlimited, you're thinking that's going to end up in a good result. But now, here we sit. Months later, not even I mean, three months into the season, halfway through the season, usually you are trying to figure out what on earth are they going to do next year and can they possibly win 75 games? And, and here they are at 48 and 34 for the season, 14 games over 500, having just swept the Boston Red Sox. And if you tuned in the game late last night, uh, you would have thought, well, same all Marlins, right? They're being no hit by, is this guy a rookie? Bale for the Boston Red Sox, a uh, relatively young guy, right? Brian Bale. And I have to give credit to our friends at uh, Action Sports, who we often pick on because uh, we believe that they are responsible or will be responsible for the eventual burial of the United States of America as a financial entity. Brian Never Bello mind, uh, you know, the what's that? This is Bello's second season. This is it. So he's yeah, I think it's Bayo is how you pronounce it, like Scott Bayo. Yeah. Bayo, B-E-L-L-O, -L -L maybe Bayo. Yeah, Bayo. Bayo, well, uh, but they bailed out uh, on Bayo uh, early in the game, and he goes seven innings of no-hit ball, and it doesn't look like the Marlins are going to break through, even with the all-star second baseman, Louis Arise, flirting with 400. Looked like they were going to uh, go with uh, zeros all the way through, and this kid uh, had not thrown enough pitches to make you think he couldn't go all the way. And, and on the heels of a perfecto by Domingo Herman uh, of the New York Yankees the previous night, I'll give you a stat, Luby. It has never happened that a no-hitter has followed a perfect game in Major League Baseball the following day. No one has ever pitched a no-hitter following the uh, aftermath of a perfect game the next day, which I guess has now occurred 24 times. And guess what? It's 0 and 24. No one's ever had a no-hitter uh, on the following day, the ensuing day. Uh, this kid came awfully close until he got to the eighth inning, and a little bleeder of an infield single finally breaks up the no-no. That was uh, by Segura who uh, we were hoping breaks out of this slump, because if he does, that would be a real asset for the club the second half of the season. And uh, then the uh, Marlins follow with a barrage of singles and, and end up uh, producing only one run. They had a bases loaded, nobody out. And uh, the worst of all scenarios uh, took place and transpired after that, where uh, the next batter strikes out, and then the ensuing batter hits into a double play. Unbelievable. Home to first double play, and so uh, they only come away with the one run, and you're thinking, eh, well, this is the game they probably get zapped, right? I mean, they've been pretty much uh, playing in good fortune all year long. These one-run games have been uh, heavily lopsided in their favor, and you figure they lose another one. Jazz Chisholm comes up, gives them uh, an insurance run in the ninth inning, and sure enough, they hold on, win it 2 nothing over the Red Sox. So uh, that sets the table, Luby. That sets the table. Uh, I remember uh, years ago, a friend of mine, uh, a guy named Cliff Collier, comes uh, up to me at the racetrack at Gulfstream Park, uh, where we'll be later on today, and says, uh, I got a horse for you that cannot lose in the first race. And I thought, yeah, sure, Cliff. I mean, how many of these have you given me over uh, your lifetime? Uh, usually uh, some reliable stuff, but uh, not, not everyone's a winner. And uh, the horse's name was Game On Dude, who was making his second start. 
went on to become a very uh, prominent, prominent and formidable stakes horse. Game on, dude. I think even won a Breeders' Cup race. Game on, dude. But uh, as of that day, it was a relative unknown, except for the fact that it had run a respectable race first time out, ran into a little bit of trouble. I remember telling my friends, hey, I got a horse that can't lose. Yeah, there's nothing better than giving out a winning horse, is there? You become an instant hero among uh, all of your followers and uh, all of your acquaintances and friends. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, who do you like, Defo? Always good to be the big maca there in a gambling situation. But I was mocked, speaking of maca, because the horse went off at 6-5. to five. And, and it's the age-old theory that I've always professed here on the show. Only one horse can win the race. So if you go up to somebody and say, here, I'm giving you a horse that cannot lose, I don't care what the price is. Yeah, it'd be nice if it was 50 to 1. Sure, those don't come along every day. But uh, this horse did uh, acquit itself very well, won that race, paid 6 to 5. I was uh, unmercifully mocked for that. But uh, the reason I bring it up is the name always stuck with me, Game On Dude, as in it's Game On Dude. And that's what we have tonight, do we not? Mike Luby Lewitz, three games against the Braves, who sits six games ahead of the Marlins in the standings. Braves at 53 and 27 on the season. And uh, we're going with the spot starter, Hoeing is uh, going to be on the mound for the uh, Marlins tonight. And uh, the opponent, uh, the Braves, have yet to name their pitcher to be determined. So that game is off the board. But uh, can they do it with Hoeing? They, they have lined up uh, Yuri Perez and uh, Sandy Alcantara for the uh, second two games or the you know, second and third games of the series. Decent uh, in terms of the way they've stacked their rotation, although Alcantara, oddly enough, is the one name. I, I, I have more confidence in Hoeing. Uh, than I do in Alcantara, in spite of the fact that every time he has a respectable series of innings now, what we all I want to come to the conclusion, oh, yeah, he's turned it around. You think he has? What do you think, Louis? Uh The Braves tonight, are, from what I'm saying, are going to have Michael Soraka on the hill. Can I pass? I thought he was solid. This year he's not really pitched at all. He's okay. always won with an 8.38 ERA. So both teams are going with, I guess, either spot starters. Spot starters, yeah. Starters. Um, Look, I, I'm looking for more of the same from Alcantara. The guy was a silent winner. The guy was a horse for them for three to four years. I would hope that what we've seen the last couple uh, starts, the late. In I, I don't know that Cy Young would be favored if he was uh, pitching in his prime against the Braves. No, 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 think? no. Not about Cy Young himself, I'm talking about. I, I expect to see the Alcantara uh, we've seen recently. This series is, I don't know if it's everything because it's, it's June into July. So, I mean, there's still half a season left. But for this club, the way that they've played, the way that fans are starting to slowly come around, this is like a benchmark. I mean, you played a, a soft schedule, supposedly. You have really not gained a lot of ground on the Braves. You know, a three-game set, you have two of your top starters going out there. I mean, they're playing as well as anyone in baseball right now. I mean, the 14 over. The only the only other two, other two times they've been 14 over 500 in a season They've won the World Series. <laughs> like that's right. Wow. Yes, that's what I mean. I did that's not know that. Good stat, yeah. Luby. Good one. Well, I saw that yesterday. Mish, Mish posted that on Twitter. So, um, look, it, it's getting very interesting. It's getting very interesting. Our man Jim Sarney puts a damper on everything, right, with, with this statistic. Marlins are 1-6 and six against the Braves this year. They've been outscored 54-22. to 22. Yeah, that might have been a different Marlin team. I think they found their stride now, Jimmy. I, I am um, a little bit more confident than I would have been. If they win two out of three against the Braves, is that not like putting up a billboard on I-95, come see us play? <laughs> no, I think so. I, I really believe that. Uh, in, in this town, obviously, it takes a long time for people to roll around to the opinion that uh, maybe we're pretty good. And, and, and we're not sure that that's the distinction we're re ready to uh, go ahead and stamp the Marlins with so far. Rather, that They do seem like, I mean, 14 games over 500, as you alluded to, Luby, a very unusual stat for the Marlins to have this late in the season. Uh, win two out of three against the Braves, and, and I think you'll start to convince people. Uh, that that would be the value and the meaning of this series. If they lose all three, they're nine games back, and it's uh, kind of ho-hum time. Uh, if they can take one of three, all right, uh, not, not the worst-case scenario. They'd have gone four and two on the road trip. If they can win two out of three against the Braves uh, off this momentum, they now have, uh, what, a five-game winning streak working. If they can take two out of three, I, I think they might stamp themselves in the minds and the hearts of the South Florida faithful, which are mostly the South Florida unfaithful, that, uh, that they might be able to do the job. All right, a bunch of other stuff going on. Uh, the hypocrisy of the National Football League, uh, it, it never ceases to amaze, does it? They, they've now suspended indefinitely several players. Uh, I think the total of players being suspended for being engaged in gambling activities on uh, – 
not just uh, you know other sports, but football specifically. The the people that were uh, betting on football have been suspended indefinitely. The others received six game suspensions, but the number is now up to ten. And, and you're wondering when is it going to become a problem where they don't have enough players in the league that haven't bet on the sport uh, that they can uh, go out there and actually field the 32 teams. Because it seems ridiculous, and, and some of this is based on where these bets were placed. A couple of the uh, players were, were directly betting on football. One guy, uh, Isaiah Rogers, apparently a cornerback for the Colts, who, who uh, immediately cut him, and uh, the other players that were uh, you know, charged with uh, uh, gambling on uh, football games, uh, he, he was betting the over-under on how many yards. Uh, he had a 1000 bucks on uh, over-under prop about how many yards one of his own team's running backs what would happen in a game? Now, are we starting to uh, reek of impropriety when players are making those kind of bets? Does it, uh, it? It doesn't mess with the integrity of the league so much as it messes with the integrity of the degenerate gambling organizations that now are fueling the league. Well, I was going to say my thing is, wouldn't a player have inside? Like, if anyone would have inside information, sure. would be a player. <laughs> like, I. I... <laughs> And I get that's why if he knows that the game plan is that they're going to run the ball 60 yeah. times and, and, and that so-and-so is going to carry it 35 times in a game. Uh, yeah, that's inside information. No doubt about it. Martha Stewart. Nice. Yeah. So, and that's why they don't want the players. But um, it, to me, people are like, oh, my God, inside information. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> he plays on the team. Obviously, he has inside information. <laughs> like, what's this? What's the big uh, breaking news there? Well, well, what do you think is going to happen with this? Well, will there be an overwhelming number of players who get busted for this uh, and are yes. suspended? Yes. Or yes. is the league sending out this harsh message that mm -hmm. we don't want you guys messing with this, even though this is how we're all making our living? Ridley, who just got a huge deal, and it's not was a star, was a burgeoning star. Yeah. Kicked out for a year. Calvin Ridley. And, and more players are doing it. <laughs> like, they're not, I, I mean, I, I don't the, the know. The message, obviously, was lost, uh, the Ridley message yeah. on many of these guys, no? Because they, yeah. they were doing this last year. Yep. Uh, while Ridley was uh, suspended, and, and everybody thought, wow, I, that's... That's an extremely harsh punishment for this guy uh, betting money that would be inconsequential to most. See, that's the thing. Mm. Uh, the money that they're betting would be like uh, you betting $25 on a game, Louis, maybe even less. Yep. So, I mean, if you make a $25 bet on, on a ball game, is that really, oh, I mean, we can't have this. This guy's a degenerate, sicko gambler. I don't think, think so. Yeah, you would think it wouldn't be a big deal. I don't know. I, I Look, I think it, there's going to have to have something come to a head because it's too readily available. Um, it's too big a part of the league. Well, and, and the encouragement, though, with which and the enthusiasm with which they're telling everybody to bet their money also, that, that can't be lost on the idea that uh, is that not also going to encourage some of the players to get involved in, in the excitement that they're presenting. And, and look how wonderful this is when they have Kevin Garnett and he's sitting there in an airport. And, oh, I hit a bet. Jamie Foxx is filming a scene in a movie, but he's looking at his phone to see if he won the Knicks game or not. Well, uh, and the, the thing is, they used to be so hush-hush that – the youth of America may not have gotten involved now because fantasy. Remember, they were tiptoeing that line of it's fantasy yes. gambling. Okay, it's not gambling. So they went all in on fantasy before they officially accepted gambling. Well, who do you think was doing fantasy? Like a lot of kids got into fantasy. So, so you're telling me it's okay for these kids to do it when they're in high school. It's okay for them to do it in college. You would get them addicted to doing it, and then they get to the pros and they're supposed to just stop. Like, I, okay, it's when it's legal. When it's okay in, in most states, when it's a, a big part of your league, I don't know. It, it, I don't know. It feels like there's got to be some kind of a compromise here uh, at some point sooner than later. They just had like a rookie symposium uh, trying to explain the evils of uh, betting on NFL football and uh, how they don't want you doing it. And, and then if you are betting on other games and other sports, don't do it in the facility. Okay. But I don't know that it's been emphasized enough. I, it seems to me the overwhelming amount uh, of uh, – of uh, a push that the uh, NFL is behind is that they, they want everybody betting on everything. Yes. So, I mean, if it impacts their players, uh, you know, that, that's a problem that the, the league has to deal with, no doubt. But is this the fair and righteous way to do it? Where a guy's careers go up in smoke for making what would be an inconsequential bet for, for most people. This would be like me betting you at a bar, 10 bucks that so-and-so is going to miss a free throw. Yep. In the middle of a game. But uh, that, that's uh, looming as a, a real problem and uh, something, in, in my opinion, a very good job of uh, dealing with. Uh, okay, final thing here. Uh, James Harden, Miami Heat. 
<laughs> Can you imagine James Harden fitting into the so-called heat culture? You want to know it's funny? And I was talking to Jimmy Butler friend. would be likely. I mean, if you were going to have uh, somebody that was uh, guilty of a homicide, Jimmy Butler might kill James Harden in the middle of a game. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not going to work at all. But what's funny is what James Harden is now. Yeah. Is exactly what the Heat need. Like defensively, they're actually pretty solid. They're unlike the Nuggets. They have a bunch of guys that play defense well. They need a guy that can score. They need a guy that can create baskets. They need a guy that can hit threes. They need a guy that can help facilitate and take pressure off of Butler and Bam. Problem is, and you may be able to get him for not a huge trade at this point. His yes. contract is thirty-six million, so that's fun. And he, in the big moments, he shies away. What's so funny is he had a really good series against the Celtics, and then in Game Seven, when Embiid sucked and they needed Harden, which is what the Heat would need out of him. He was worse. He sucked. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we've seen that, unfortunately. How, how many disappearing and vanishing acts has he done in the seventh game of a series? Uh, it seems like it's uh, well, repetitive that? behavior, no? Yeah, what do you mean? He's made a career with that. In that Thunder series, like, it's funny. People talk about how the Heat had dominated the Thunder. They sort of didn't. Like, what the Thunder did was smart. They're like, okay, cover Durant and Westbrook. Our young guy, Harden, who's been a beast and helped get us into the finals, you want to leave him open? Cool. Well, the problem was he couldn't hit the side of a fucking barn. Like Harden was wide open yeah. that entire series. And he never just, was I more wrong about anything. I, he, I had predicted he would be the reason that the Thunder beat the Heat that series. He, Don't sleep on James Harden, I think was my theory at the yes, time. Yes. yes it was. <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty fucking stupid. <laughs> but that's All right. A lot of stuff going on. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, degenerate Fridays. Uh, we're going to degenerate today. We'll be out at Coldstream Park later on. Stop by and say hello for the uh, Mike Mayo Lunchbox Show. And, of course, uh, we're coming up in just a few minutes here with our live show, uh, Defo, uh, the Defo Show on South Florida Live. Uh, we uh, hope you'll subscribe to that. Have a good time. And then uh, we're shutting it down for a couple of days anyway as uh, we're hoping everybody enjoys a, a very safe and festive July 4th weekend, a celebration of what's great about America, including that Supreme Court decision yesterday. Let's go backwards <laughs> into the distant past. <laughs> when is the Supreme Court going to vote to bring back slavery? Oh, Jesus. No, I mean, it's only a matter of time, isn't it, with, with these guys? N nice job there, Donnie Trump. Way to go. 6-3 of conservative schmucks. Uh, they, they've done it again. They, they've managed to have another monumental blockbuster decision that everybody is appalled by. And uh, th these are the people that are running the government while they're all on the take on some exotic fishing trip. And, uh, you know, receiving all kinds of gifts from Republican donors. Uh, that that uh, sort of reeks of impropriety, speaking of which. I mean, maybe Goodell ought to get involved there, huh? Come on, Raj. Shake up the Supreme Court. All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you for tuning in. And uh, well, we'll see you again uh, on the next edition of Defoe on Five. Yeah.